Aesop's Fables. So Aesop, um, or the Aesop's Fables, is uh, uh, is attributed to a Greek by the name of Aesop. Now he lived before the Common Era, and um, I guess one understanding of when he lived was, if you can think as far back as, you know, the if you think in the terms of like philosophy and the three great philosophers, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. Well, Aesop lived maybe 150, 160 years before Socrates. You know, that's certainly close to 3,000 years ago, right? Um, well, he, he, so he lived in this era, this very mythological era, but also in an era where, where maybe um, this notion of um, um, nature was certainly more appreciated probably than today. And you, you, we can argue that because, you know, after the Industrial Revolution and the, the advent of uh, technology, today it's, it's certainly more evidently uh, um, obvious that um, nature is not as much of a priority as it was back in the days when when um, industry hadn't quite inundated societies, right? Well, Aesop, you know, this writer that by essence very little know it, very little is known about, and in essence, really, what what is known about him is through through his fables. Um. He was an individual who, in his writings, applied this element of anthropomorphism. Now, anthropomorphism is an element in which non-human entities were giving these human-like qualities. Um, and, and this is evident in, in generally all of his fables. And so let's ask ourselves, why? why? I mean, obviously, uh, you know, in addition to the the artistic enhancement of, of these anthropomorphic elements. Um, we can also state that he, he applied it as a way of saying, look, you're not just reading these fairy tales or these fables um, in the fictional sense, you know, in the sense of escapism, so to speak. It's not Peter Pan per se, right? It's not, it's not Disney we're, we're reading here, so to speak. Um, instead, you know, it's, it's Aesop's way of communicating with us and, and informing us and saying, um, hey, these, these are not just animals that you're, that you're reading about. This is, that fox is you, or those crabs are you. So it's a way for us to relate to the connections that he's trying to make, right? Um, and so let's take a look. So let's take a look at these stories. And the first, The Fox and the Grapes, <clears throat> is a story in which a fox, you know, he comes about and he runs to this tree and he sees these, you know, by, by at least initially, he sees these highly desirable grapes. And he says, oh, fantastic, I'm going to, going to shoot for these grapes and they're going to be so tasty well he tries he tries to you know he's climbing the ladder and he's trying to um he is indeed trying to get a hold of these grapes but um it comes to be evident he's unable to obtain them so regardless of his desire he's flat out and just simply unable to acquire these tasty grapes so when he's unable to acquire them he you know he's and he's frustrated probably from countless efforts of trying to get them and he tempers those frustrations you know that his his desire is unable to be realized he tempers it by resorting to criticism and so of that criticism one of the most famous you know, the famous line, sour grapes, oh, that experience. That experience was a bunch of sour grapes, right? 
It's a reference that comes straight from from Aesop's fables. So so, and, and it's evident, right? You know, for for the connection with humans that when we're unable to obtain something, something material, as in the case of the fox and the grapes, you know, just like with humans, they weren't able to have certain things. Um, and our desire strong for something, well, we'll resort to criticism as a way of easing the frustrations of being unable to acquire a particular something. But the, the, the other thing I wanted to point out here is that the story also has other references. And, and one of those references, for example, it's noted in in the in the European sense by other European writers who who also wrote rewrote you know a, a, a different version of Fox and the Grapes and and this different version was the version of um, in which a young man he's staring out into a mansion so to speak and he sees a group of uh, young ladies. So as he observes them, you know, he's, he's staring very intently and very keenly, so to speak. And um, a gentleman comes about and he, and he approaches him and he says, Hey, keep your distance, man. You know, they're too young. And so he gets frustrated. Or one could assume that he gets frustrated. Of course, this is a, <clears throat> this is a, a story, you know, in which the sexual desire is an inappropriate sexual desire you know it's these are young ladies considerably younger than this this gentleman and, and uh, he's having these inappropriate desires well he'll temper that sexual frustration he'll say oh only a only a only a boy that's green would have such experiences with them oh yes i'm staying away because they're unripe right um so by relation, right, it's not just materiality, but here, in this case, it's also this engagement with human relations, so to speak. Um, so so what's uh, Aesop getting at? You, you know, and, and, and the theme is obvious, right? This, this desire for something that's, when unobtainable, usually... Um, provokes in all of us, or in humans anyways, provokes in humans this idea of criticism or, 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 or um, a con contrasting critique. Well, there's a cognitive dissonance with the, with the fox. In other words, if, um, in one sense, the fox is um, desiring, right? The fox is desiring these grapes, but his inability to obtain them, um, I guess, rationally, you know, in his mind, he's got this desire, which is not necessarily a bad thing. It's a positive thing. But it, it, but it quickly shifts, right? When, when you can't realize this positive desire, well, then, well, then what gives about? Well, what gives about is, is frustration. And so, you bring about criticism as a way of tempering his inability to realize that desire. So let's take a look at the next uh, fable. And in the next fable, The Two Crabs by, by Aesop, uh, you have a mother crab and a baby crab or a son. And as they're walking and, and uh, the mother starts observing the the walking pattern of the son, the the mother tells the son, hey, stop walking sideways, you know, tilting sideways like that. You would look much better if you walk in a straight line. And of course, the, the baby crab, you know, stares his mother and looks in her direction and says, you know, of course, mother, yes. Mm -hmm. You'd help me greatly if you could lead by example. You know um, um, that if you're if you're going to demand something, that you know, exemplify it for me. Well, 
what's implied here is this leading by example and you know we have to bring up certain questions at least in terms of the mother crab is that yes it's true you know if you lead by example then then others would follow your path or that's the expectation but is that true you know that if we if we model something for someone then in that they're going to be able to realize that um, desirable or, or that or that whatever it is that we're illustrating for them. Well, one issue could be discipline, right? You know, uh, um, if the person's willing enough to to apply the sacrifice of, of time and discipline, then then yes, you know, it, it is brought about. But um, in some cases, re despite the the uh, the most extraneous forms of discipline, um, that ability is not realized. Why? Because, as in the case of the crab, they don't have the physical ability, right? They don't. They don't have the the you know their, their their natural structure does not allow them to realize this ability, right? This capacity to be able to to walk a certain way. So just like the crab, right? I mean, just not the crab, but just like the fox, there is a type of cognitive dissonance. There, there's a type of cognitive dissonance in, in in that the mother crab has a desire to see her son be the most illustrious crab possible and um you know that's you know by relation the the anthropomorphic connection is that if you think of a parent well how many parents don't want their children to be model children don't want their children to 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 be the most illustrious and observable but but in humans genetically anyways some have we, we all have different capacities physical and and you could argue even mental right um now arguably you know mentally anyways it, with with certainly certain um uh, with great effort and and um dedication um, we can all become superbly rational, arguably. You know, there's a philosophy out there that that mental capacity is is um, innate, so to speak. But for the most part, you, you know, it's it's argued that yes, you know, we all can realize these these mental capacities physically. However, and despite one's greatest abilities. You know, despite our greatest desires, they may not be realized because our abilities are limited. So, you know, as, as much as I want to say, for example, that, oh gosh, I, I would love to be, I strongly desire to be Michael Jordan, right? Well, no matter what I do, you know, I'm certainly, I certainly don't have the height and certainly don't have the jumping ability, um, so I might resort in my frustrations of being unable to to have that Jordanist capacity. Well then I'm gonna I'm gonna be critical just like the fox and I'm gonna have to come and realize that my abilities do not allow me to uh, bring about this, such desires. So so there you have it. You see the, the connection between the two. The two stories, you know, certainly are very evident. Um, and so there you have it, the fox and the grapes and the two crabs. Both of them apply this issue of a, a desire. And both of them wind up in both critique and, and an understanding of uh, the limitations of ability. Fox and the grapes, two crabs.